Hi there. Today, we're going to talk about the elephant in the room, or rather, consent in gaming. Or, more particularly, the PDF put out by Monty Cook Games just recently of the same name. Uh, it's been shared around a lot, and it's had a massive aftermath. And I think, you know, if we consider that if this had come from any other source, um, it might not be having the same impact. So one of the reasons for that is that people are sharing it widely, and they see, oh, this is a relatively major name within the game publishing industry that has taken the step of putting out this document to talk about uh, how to approach problematic topics uh, within gaming, and also to listen for when there's a problematic topic in gaming. Um, I'm going to be criticizing uh, some of the text uh, uh, kind of in, in going through it, and I'm going to be talking about some of my concerns with regards to it. I believe that in a home game situation, uh, we get to know one another and we listen. We try and be sensitive. Uh, we don't rub salt in wounds because we want to become friends. And a lasting campaigns are built upon friendships. And so naturally, when we become aware of past traumas or topics that someone is sensitive to, uh, we modulate play, and sometimes we pause play to talk about it in a home game. And what I mean by that is that there's sort of a classic way of approaching this that is preoccupied in oral tradition, and it's part of being a good game master, a good host, a good player, and a good hobbyist. To keep in mind uh, what is on the table and what is a non-starter for your fellow gamers. And when you learn that something is out of place, that you've overstepped a boundary, how to walk back from it. And I think it's relatively well-intentioned. A great deal of the document is built from those traditions. But I think it tries to uh, break some new ground, and I think it misses uh, a very important point. And this is where I'm going to begin with my point of view before we get into a direct analysis of the text. So, criticism one. Before you're in a position where you're going to be using the consent document or the checklist that is at the back of this book and is put forward as a new method to stand alongside the X card or to um, replace it or be another option for how to approach difficult situations in gaming, uh, before you reach that point, naturally, whenever we're playing RPGs, uh, you select a game. You select a game and a genre when you talk to your group. You're sitting down to play Dungeons and Dragons. You're sitting down to play Vampire the Masquerade. You're sitting down to play Star Trek Adventures. And I put to you that the idiom of the genre of those games uh, will tell you a lot about whether you are comfortable with it. And also, in order for the game to work, uh, some of these things have to be treated with somewhat directly. Uh, or it becomes a bit of a stretch away from the core brand that the genre has established, that the game has established, if these things are omitted from gameplay. So what I mean to say is that in Dungeons and Dragons, we go into dark places. We hold up our lanterns and our torches and we peer into the dark. Sometimes darkness is cast. Sometimes we fall into water and our lights are doused. And in those situations, the darkness and whatever sounds are within can be frightening. In that sense, the, the fear, the very real fear of the dark, even though it doesn't often occur in D&D, is part and parcel with the D&D experience. Likewise, the monster manual is full of vermin. Going into a cellar and dealing with rats or giant centipedes which are crawling over a supply store in an abandoned dungeon, or a nest of giant spiders in the Mirkwood. These are classic genre touchstones. That's not impossible to play D&D without them, but when you imagine D&D, they might be things that come to mind quite quickly. And one of the things that I think is missing from consent in gaming not only the fact that when you've chosen to play D&D, &D, you may have already thought about these things, and then you 
go backtrack and editorialize them out. But on top of this, I think that they're missing the idea that there's a difference between horror and something being present at a comfortable distance within the game. They talk about lines and veils occasionally and fading to black, but the idea that confinement and forced confrontation with something where you're eye to eye with a spider in a very enclosed space or even trapped in its web is another matter from perhaps avoiding it entirely or shooting at it with a bow and arrow at a comfortable distance. That are different things. One of them is horror, and another one of them is just inclusion in the story. Likewise, when a character is exhibited to be the villain through his cruelty to animals, we don't necessarily dwell over long on the fact that the villain has perhaps displaced uh, a swine from their front yard that the players are investigating by means of a shovel, but we don't need to go into the squicky details at all times. There's modulations as the game master about how much you're going to describe these difficult things. And when I talk about the classic way of approaching these topics, of being friends and of easing into difficult topics, one of the things that you will do is you'll carefully watch as you describe the slime that's all over these otherworldly serpents that's writhing in a pit, and there's an unearthly glow upon the walls that drips with a strange substance, at some point, you'll have an idea of whether this is a comfortable description, whether it's an interesting, scary movie kind of horror, or whether someone is really getting grossed out, and it's becoming an uncomfortable experience. Not everyone's great at reading people, and some of us are somewhere on the autism spectrum, and they shouldn't be excluded from playing role-playing games. But I contend that the classic way of kind of carefully easing into graphic description of horrific circumstances is perhaps a much more comfortable way of approaching play as a game master and as a world builder. Because, say I told you that your character has no hand, that I'm not going to allow anyone with hands in the game. And you say, but I've imagined someone with a hand. And it's very difficult for you to really be interested in wanting to pursue playing a character now that I've created this new rule. And the idea that you're not meant to hit someone with your hands, as in polite society where we don't hit one another, well, we, we don't use our hands to, to make obscene gestures very often. Uh, I, I could do one where I, I erected only my middle finger just now, but I won't, um, but I still have a hand. It's a part of my world and of my character. When I'm the game master, in some respect, the entirety of the world is my character. It's something that I'm creating and I'm invested in that I derive a joy from playing. I'm not going to put the grisliest parts in front of the players very often, or perhaps never, depending on how someone is sensitive to different things. But those elements are a present by filling out this consent document and saying there will never be spiders in this world. There will never be uh, gaslighting and doubting one's sensations in this world. Um, that that is that is a that is now no longer part of the fiction of this world. Um, it's problematic in some kinds of gameplay. If I'm developing a setting, if I have a long-term setting, and these elements um, are going to be omitted from the game, I would sooner retire from the field of GMing than omit these things entirely. One of the items on the checklist is real-world religion. Um, And I'm not entirely certain where the boundaries of that word necessarily means of what that means in gameplay. But I will tell you that in the world of Harn, which I favor very keenly, there are a number of 
polytheistic or henotheistic churches on the Isle of Harn, which somewhat closely resemble and sometimes distantly resemble different religious institutions upon the Isle of Harn. They have a very strong influence in some societies, and some of their idiosyncrasies are also the subject of adventures. Well, what if, after deciding that we were going to play a game on Harn, and that was part of the initial pitch, perhaps even in a convention game, which I'll treat with the concept and the idea of convention games in a little while, what if I was now under the constraints of omitting real-world religion from the game? Um, so does this, what does this mean to Harn? Um, and how much of a discussion is a, it worthy of both the player's time, who may feel uncomfortable, and of mine, and of everyone else's as we delay the game, to kind of discover this before we begin play? Um, what I mean to say is that the classic way of approaching these kind of difficult situations is to be careful, to watch people's facial expressions, their signals be open and ready to pause play and be open to a pause of play coming from someone who says, whoa, 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 or whatever it is that is their safe word that says, can we take a minute here? Um, well, see, I'm not one of those people that says, well, you know, once you sat down to play, you know, if you don't like what's happening, you can just leave. I'm a little bit more accommodating than some of the reactionaries in that respect. But I do think that the complexities of how a topic arises have so much to do with the fiction. What if we include spells in a game which immolate people alive with fire damage? And that when you run out of hit points, when fire damage has been inflicted upon you, your character has burned to death. What about cold damage? Flesh is literally falling off of the bones because it is so deprived of blood, and the blood indeed is frozen within it, and death is now coming to a limb or a hand or a finger because of cold damage. These things are horrible, but they're also baked into D&D. What level of description is almost very much core to whether these things become comfortable or uncomfortable. If you're uncomfortable watching this video because I've gotten to the point where on some occasions I may have described things more graphically than you're accustomed to, I invite you to leave a thumbs down or to leave a comment about when I broke that line or to stop watching the video because this is not a two-way communication form like a game table. But I am going to kind of bring up how the vividness of gameplay, the vividness of the world, is another place where we as game masters and as world builders uh, have a lot of passion. And so as these different deleted sectors of our worlds um, become reserved away from gameplay, well, then it is that our enthusiasm retracts and diminishes and the, the passion uh, leaves us. Now, in collaborative storytelling, where only what happens within the game, um, or even what happens in the game is something which is uh, sort of improvised, but is never really part of a fixed world so much as it is um, a story told in gameplay, I understand. I, I play games through the stance of, uh, stepping through the looking glass. When I'm a game master, I, I really, I want to be uh, like the wardrobe that leads to Narnia. That is my role, it is, it is, to, it is to be the vessel of that world. I, I, I find myself challenged by this, by this document, and by this method. I'm not saying that it, it, there's not good intention in it. And let's take a break. And let's actually get into the into the the PDF itself and look at it directly. This is the core sentiment which I find problematic. The default answer is no. Ideally, consent opts starts with opting into things you want to try. 
That's the goal of preemptive tools like consent checklists. But it's inevitable that sometimes it also involves opting out of things you want to avoid. I have no problem with that. Of course, there are people who purposely disrespect or ignore someone's choices, but more likely, someone at the table will add something to the game that is unexpectedly difficult. It is always okay to say no after something is introduced, even if it wasn't talked about ahead of time. Now, what no means, and whether this means that we fast forward, or we delete, or we pause, play, and talk it out, or if it's just deleted and doesn't occur, um, whether this thing no longer exists in the world, um, this is something which this document doesn't treat with. And that's one of the problems is that is that they say, okay, well, you can, you can, you never have to be subjected to things that you're not comfortable with. Um, but how, how do we then move on past that? They talk about how you can say sorry when you, something comes out of your mouth that's misplaced. Um, that, you know, if you put your foot in your mouth and talk about something or make a joke that is misplaced, uh, how to move past that. But they don't talk about how the fiction in the game moves past these moments where uh, something unexpected occurs. And the default answer is no. Also begs certain questions of, well, how many different things do I need to anticipate? The answer is no, too. That's one point. The next thing to talk about is that uh, omitting certain things can be offensive, as offensive to some people as including them is. I believe, in my reading of Good Society, the Jane Austen verse RPG or collaborative storytelling game, uh, the author has made a decision that because race doesn't exist in the world of Jane Austen's novels, then race doesn't really exist in the game. You can pick a different color person to inhabit the world of Regency England, 1811 to 1819 or so. Uh, you can choose whichever shade of skin, but the problematic issues of a young naval officer who's acquitted himself well in the Royal Navy um, and risen in the ranks despite that he began his life uh, in the orlop of a slave ship. Um, and now he has come to call on a beautiful young English woman. Well, that question, the game says, is, is not going to be treated with. We're, we're going to ignore the racism and the colonialism that is holding up the fantastic wealth that the people in Austen's novels, enjoy. And in fact, you know, there are still people in chattel slavery in the West Indies, and some of the fortunes are being had from that. Perhaps a very interesting player character would be someone who is a, a secret daughter of that has been legitimized, sent back to England to finishing school. But she has curly hair, and she is less fair than some of her classmates. And yet... There's a fortune waiting for her, and that, you know, someone, someone back, back in the West Indies would like her to live a good life, and the troubles that arise from that. Are they more Dickensian? Um, that's a good question. Are they just, is that a modern story that doesn't belong in Jane Austen? Or is that just the kind of story that Jane Austen couldn't tell in her time because of the constraints of her publishing? And yet, if we ignore or rule out telling those kinds of stories in the present day, are we offending the story, are we forgetting the story of people of color in those times? I think that's just a, a valid question. That's a, that's a point to be made about how omitting can be as offensive, possibly. That's a doubt that I have. Can possibly as offensive as including possible um, that, that are, are useful. Um, the X card is one of them, and they offer a few other examples. Uh, Brie Larson, um, 
had uh, a very interesting VHS styled technique where fast forward and montage and uh, fade to black were all different cinema-esque options about how to confront an awkward moment or an awkward inclusion in the game. I didn't see that included here, nor did I see the Luxton technique, which I think treats with the very real problems of see no evil. The idea that when there are, for example, entire tribes of goblins which are driven from the land, what happens to the young? Some people say that we shouldn't, we shouldn't treat with that question. Some groups say if we ignore that, we're betraying some of the stories of indigenous people whose entire family groups were driven into the river and the children hid in the reeds. That's a question, okay? Not every group has the same answer, but ruling something out entirely and saying, see no evil, again, it can be as problematic. And that's something which I have not seen from any of these kinds of documents besides the Luxton technique, which says when something that is associated with past trauma comes up, when there's something that's too difficult, pause play and talk about it like adults. Take as long as it needs. Don't rub salt in wounds. Be considerate of one another. And remember that you're here to play a game together as friends. I believe the Luxton technique being, you know, probably the best in my opinion, might be lost somewhere in the bowels of G+, now that G+, is gone. But the thing that Sean K. Reynolds and Shauna Germain's Consent in Gaming puts forward as its new tool that it believes people should use is the RPG Consent Checklist. And this is where we're going to spend the rest of our time. Because this is the most problematic thing that this document has brought up. Because it's just one-liners. Everyone has a copy of this in front of them. And they can say, green, enthusiastic consent. Yellow, only if veiled are off stage. Might be okay on stage, but requires discussion ahead of time. Or I'm not sure. And red, hard line, don't include. This list is by no means, incomple- by no means complete. There are some aspects of it which are blank, and an implication is that other triggers or other sensitive areas of topic uh, could be penciled in. And yet, by penciling in, someone might have the sensation that they're stepping outside of the norm, that whatever they're sensitive to is is kind of special and rare, and, and maybe maybe they should toughen up a bit. Or, you know, they've put their handwriting on it. When they hand it in, the, the GM will know that, that this particular person penciled this particular thing in, and, and it, it's outing them, it's outing their sensitivity before play has begun, and so much of the rapport that we develop in play, the breaking of bread together, or pizza in many cases, has not occurred yet. And yet, here we are outing some of our deepest wounds to one another um, without ever beginning play. That's, that's awkward to me, let me tell you. Um, now, of course, you could use an online tool that totally anonymized all these answers, but then it even becomes that much more cold and inhumane to the game master whose world is, you know, in some respects, uh, one in the same body with their own mind, as I discussed earlier. So horror. Like I said, this game doesn't, this, this document doesn't treat with the question of how horror being confined and kind of subjected to something in a way that you, you cannot get away from it is different from the inclusion of something at all. Bugs, blood, demons, eyeballs, gore, harm to animals, harm to children, rats, and spiders. Well, you know, a lot of those things are, I mean, if we ignore the differentiation between inclusion and horror, uh, many of those things are part and parcel with Dungeons and Dragons. Harm to animals, well, there are bears in the woods, and wolves, and they've long been a uh, part of the dangers of Dungeons and Dragons world. Um, Blood, well, there's a bleeding condition in many versions of D&D. Pathfinder 1 featured it heavily. 
Um, are we going to leave that out? Are we just going to talk about it in the abstract? What, what does it mean for this to be a, a red line? Um, demons. Uh, well, I understand in some respect, uh, but it, it's an interesting one because of religious upbringings. Um, the only reason that this might be objectionable is specifically because someone's religious beliefs or past religious beliefs uh, might color that. Well, there are other religious beliefs that believe that some, all women should uh, go around with a covering on their head, or that um, young women uh, unmarried should not be in the company of anyone besides their brothers and cousins. <sighs> Is that also something that, you know, we're, we're going to, we're, we're going to s keep out of the game based on one person's report that this is, this should be excluded. Um, what about the person who wants to play, uh, a female character with an uncovered head? Well, what have we done to that person? Um, so that's what I mean is that it, it's illiberal in some respects. The, 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 the totality of this as it is presented, as they start to lengthen these lists and the things that got on these lists, boy, it, it does seem to me like it, it can go in directions. Um, but let's continue. So I, I believe a lot of these elements, it would be difficult to call something Dungeons and Dragons, and most notably the dark, which I discussed earlier. Relationships, romance, fade to black, explicit, between PCs and NPCs, between PCs, sex, fade to black, explicit, between PCs and NPCs, between PCs. Uh, all I have to say here is that uh, Vampire the Masquerade, uh, in this game, uh, the player characters are former humans who predate upon current humans, living humans, in a manner which is one-to-one -one similar with how sexual predators predate on people. No less, it is explicit in the fiction of the world of Vampire the Masquerade that once in the embrace of, uh, of the vampire's kiss, both participants are in an ecstatic state, as in even a hideous Nosferatu is suddenly chasing down a person in, a, in an alleyway and accosting them for their life's blood the moment that their teeth make contact puts them into an ecstatic state. That's kind of gross and weird. And it, it's, it's, it's sexual horror. And, and, and frankly, it's very difficult to play Vampire the Masquerade without some elements of that horror. Some clans of vampires can only feed on the blood of children. I will leave it at that. Because, frankly... You got to figure out how you're going to deal with that. I've always thought that the classic way, the default way, the default answer is not no, but with veils, especially once you've selected a genre. That's all I have to say on the topic of this area is that it'd be very difficult to play Vampire the Masquerade. Social and cultural issues, homophobia, racism, real world religion, sexism, and specific cultural issues. This comes down to historical periods and how to treat with them. Some people are successful in playing Call of Cthulhu somehow by some means either editing out or softening some of the gender and racial issues of the 1920s era. Um, in other games, the game system's already made a decision, as I talked about in Good Society, uh, to not treat with it at all, um, the, this historical period. Um, as I'm trying to make the seven strange seas, well, there's another um, historical period where colonialism is very difficult to turn away from as a part of the world of the game. Um, so it's, it's a difficult question to answer. And I, I think that maybe this is, these are good items to discuss in any kind of historical game is how you're going to treat with these things, leaving them out entirely. Like I said, earlier can offend certain sensibilities. Mental and physical health, cancer, claustrophobia, freezing to death, 
gaslighting, genocide, heat stroke, natural disasters, paralysis, and physical restraint, police, police aggression, pregnancy, miscarriage, abortion, self-harm, se severe weather, sexual assault, assault, starvation, terrorism, torture, and thirst. Uh, thirst. Um, again, Dungeons and Dragons. Um, uh, running out of rations and running out of water are um, a foundational part of uh, most of the classic kind of D&D. &D. It's something which has fell by the wayside in large part, but it has been important in prior editions, and it's something which I think is at least already yellow the moment that you've chosen to play D&D &D in many respects. You've, you probably should consider that sort of stuff as you consider D&D &D as a possible option. Likewise, on the topic of uh, terrorism, you can't play Werewolf the Apocalypse without flying into uncontrollable rages of eco-terrorism. Your characters do things by any means necessary out of emotion to defend the Earth. And they use violence to do it. And they're heedless of how there was a family in that car that they just threw off the bridge during the rage. Well, that's what I want to rejoin to, is that this document, I think, is built and put out by a company that has made its home in a generic RPG, Cypher System. And in fact, that's in many respects what I feel like this document, the perspective that it's coming from, is coming from a game system which is vacant, or pretends to be vacant, of genre notions and of the idiom of genre. And that, you know, as you build up a particular game for your group and you choose a genre and a setting, some of these questions might surprise you. And I, I, I truly, I do understand that. Um, but for the most part, most games are more specific. Body modification is an inseparable part of Shadowrun, for example. And I've discussed the examples of the classic World of Darkness games, and I believe that the survival aspects of Dungeons and Dragons are not so remote in the game's past that they're not something which you should consider with your group. I've realized that the lights have gone out on me as I've been making this video. Don't let the light go out in your mind when you're thinking about how to be sensitive to your fellow player characters. And in that respect, I would just like to be an advocate for the classic way of playing where one builds trust with other gamers in the face-to-face -face gaming world. When you run a convention game, make sure to responsibly describe the entirety of anything that you think could be uh, objectionable in the scenario and to responsibly describe sort of the tone and what you think the movie rating might be. Um, and if you're going to con a convention game and you sign up for a particular slot, um, you know, uh, consider during your limited convention times how you may have a lot of options for which games to pick and that some games might match what you feel uh, you're comfortable with uh, more than others. In other words, we all have a responsibility to be sensitive, to be listeners, and also to take care of ourselves and to be recognizant and respectful when people do make choices to care for themselves also. Um, but we also have to recognize that this is a creative hobby which is full of spontaneity and um, that red tape and, um, and a feeling of mother may I um, could also um, uh, make it into a dirge. Um, I think I could continue playing as a player if this became a, a gold standard and as this document became two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten, twenty pages long of potential objections as different people who felt marginalized by not being included, well, I could keep playing 
I, I, I think I could probably, I could probably still enjoy the hobby, but my creative, uh, force, um, and my, my dread that I might make a mistake and uh, that I might step on a toe, that I might forget something in this document uh, as I was improvising or even as I was writing a scenario and building something up for my group and I might forget something. Um, I feel like if I made a mistake and these things were in writing, I, I would be in a lot more trouble and being sorry would be... Um, a lot harder to communicate and maybe not even good enough. Uh, in spite of the, the fact that the game, the book says, be sorry. And, and that, that's, you know, apologizing is, is a thing that will happen. I think that you're still in more trouble. On the other side of the coin, I think that writing all this down and saying you're okay with something and then suddenly being face to face with it and it's too much or the way it's being portrayed is over a line that you didn't think you were ready for, if you signaled green and then you realized that this is not green, you might feel like you put this into writing and you're stuck with it. You might, you might soldier on through something that's uncomfortable because it's in this sort of sterile, written way. Those are just some concerns about this consent and gaming document. Uh, I don't know how much I'm going to edit and dress up this video because it's kind of long, but I wanted to share the totality of my point of view on it in a calm and rational manner. I hope that you're having a great gaming autumn. I'm the Complex Games Apologist.